Assalamu alaikum YouTube. Ahlan wa sahlan, marhaban. Today I'm going to talk about Ibn Hazm, the famous Zahiri. And he's probably the most influential figure with respect to Ibn Arabi's legal thought. And he lived in the 11th century. And so he, his name was Ibn Hazm al Farasi al Andalusi. And he died in 1064. And he died when Ibn Barrajan was only six years old. And Ibn Arif was born 24 years after Ibn Hazm died. Just to give some context with the previous figures that we've spoken about. And so he was remembered for being like a traditionalist or a scripturalist, uh, someone who collected uh, hadith and graded them. He was a genealogist, a religious historian, theologian, philosopher, and a Wahiri legal theorist, a uh, usuli. And uh, he was author of the famous treatise regarding love, the crown of the dove, so tawqa al-hamama. And so he was of Persian descent, hence he's got the name al-Farasi, and his grandfather was the first to settle in Andalusia in his family lineage. And so the father of Ibn Hazm, Ahmed, received a good education and served as vizier to the Emirid state. And he was known for his uh, conscious of justice, so he was a strong, ethical, conscientious person who believed in justice. And his father was known for having uh, precision with language, uh, loving rhetoric, balagha in particular, which he passed on to his son, Ibn Hazm. He was able to provide his son with the best education and a luxurious childhood, surrounded by women of the harem, who were his first teachers of Quran. And they also taught a lot of literature and poetry. Ibn Hazm, he's well known in the Arab world for being a great writer and he's appreciated for his literature and his poetry. Ibn Hazm would later say, you must forgive me for the great part of my reading has been done by the light of gold and silver. So he grew up in luxury. And the scholar Vilches says, alluding to the fact that the soft life and wealth of the court had kept him away from true knowledge. So Ibn Hazm felt that this luxurious upbringing that he had did not benefit him in terms of knowledge. When Ibn Hazm's father died in 1012, Gregorian, he moved to Almeria, where the Masarian school, the school of Ibn Masarra, was in full swing, although he did not stay there long. At the age of 26, he underwent a life-changing event. A man who had been both a friend of his father and his own boyhood friend had passed away. And Ibn Hazm attended his burial. When he arrived at the mosque, he tried to imitate his fellow worshippers by genuflecting and was upbraided by the mosque-goers. So basically, Ibn Hazm, he was going to Salat al-Janazah, funeral prayer. He did not know how to pray. He did not know the actions of the prayer, which ways to move, how the ritual was performed, and he was scolded by the other worshippers there. And so Ibn Hazm expressed his regret in his own account, saying, I had reached this age, age of 26, and I did not know how to say even one prayer properly. So Ibn Hazm went to the nearest jurist of reputation and began to study Maliki law, dedicating himself to it for the next three years. And as we've mentioned, Maliki law was the dominant school in Islamic Spain. So having mastered Maliki fiqh, he began debating and arguing with other schools of law. During this process, he became convinced of Shafi'i fiqh, and later fully advocated for Bahirite fiqh. So we have uh, the Hanafi Madhab 
as being, they say, more rational. Um, they call they call them al rai because they would, you know, in their rhetoric and dialogue, dialogue they would say, ra'ita kedha kedha, ra'i kedha kedha. And then you have the Malikis, who are just kind of slightly more textual, you might say. Then you have the Shafi'is, who are even more textual. And then you have Hanbalis, who are more textual. And then Zahiris are kind of way out there as being the most scripturalist, textualist, or whatever terms you want to use to describe it. Literalist, or whatever you want to say. They all really don't really capture the picture that well. And so he went from Maliki all the way to Vahiri. It's quite a transformation in legal theory. And so alongside Ibn Hazm's teacher, Abu al-Khiyar, he began teaching publicly the Vahiri school, the Vahiri method. And as I've stated in early video, earlier videos in this series, that was almost like treason or rebellion um, the Maliki philosopher state jurists were not going to allow this to happen on their watch. So when the Caliph Hisham III al Mu'tad heard of this, he immediately banned them both from teaching, stripping them of their teaching positions at the great mosque of Cordoba. And it was then that Ibn Hazm became an ascetic, Zahid, and a renunciant, Munqabad which we, we discussed these terms earlier in the series. But never quite a mystic, a mu'tabar. Nonetheless, he irreversibly became part of the anti-establishment counterculture of which the mystics were also a part. As we mentioned before, the, the ascetics, renunciants, and the mystics were all part of the same countercurrent culture. They were different groups or different inclinations, um, different intellectual genealogies, you might say, but they were always in conversation with one another. They were the outlaws, the outcasts. They were not the mainstream, and because of that, they inevitably ran into each other quite often. So Ibn Hazm abandoned government and any political career, going over to the Wahiri camp and dedicating himself to his studies only which the famous Orientalist Goldseer dates to 1025. He became itinerant, constantly trying to avoid government persecution, and he held very controversial debates with the Maliki state jurists of Almeria regarding the direction of the Qibla. It got so heated that the ruler of Seville, al Mu'atadid, ordered the public burning of Ibn Hazm's books which is uh, famously depicted in a Spanish stamp. Ibn Hazm died in 1064 on the land his grandfather had first lived on in Niebla in Andalusia. He would later be remembered by Ibn al-Arif in an allusion to his critical contempt for all types of establishment jurists. The tongue of Ibn Hazm and the sword of al-Hajjaj bin Yusuf were sisters. And so Ibn Hazm today is uh, quite influential, has quite the legacy, and there are still people who claim that they are self-proclaimed Bahiris, um, despite there being no uh, continuity in the Medhab any longer, like Sheikh Muqbil in Yemen recently. And, um, you know, so Ibn Hazm, he still... Um, has some, uh, you know, books out there which you can go and read. Um, you know, his very famous one is Ihkam. I think I have it somewhere around here. I'm not exactly sure where in my library I put it at the moment. Um, and uh, Ibn Hazm, you know, is a very famous for um, his literature, his... Uh, theology and all those things that I mentioned earlier and uh, as we will get to see in uh, upcoming videos um, he was also influential on Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi who even has a, you might say mystical vision of Ibn Hazm which I will talk about in the next video most likely 
So thank you for watching. Please do comment, like, subscribe, all of that um, so that I can keep making more content for you guys regarding Islamic history. And feel free to comment and give ideas uh, below as to what type of Islamic history videos you'd like to see in the future. Thank you.